thank you, God, that we can be here today. And, and Father, that as we look into your word today, Lord, would you reveal your spirit to us? And uh, Lord, as we study your word, would you bring it to life in our lives? We thank you for this. Amen. Well, this morning, church, we're going to be uh, speaking about when the whole earth shakes um, out of the book of Hebrews. We'll be in a few sections of the book of Hebrews. And, uh, and there's, a, there's uh, always lots of things going on in our world. And, and of late, there seems to be lots of things happening very quickly. There, there doesn't seem to be much of a moment where something new or something more or something major isn't existing. And I mentioned that a couple weeks ago as I talked about spinning on the dizzy chair at the park and how we can get quite dizzy with all the up-to-the-minute news and information uh, that we live in. And uh, something that the, that the Bible talks about that we find is that um, the, the earth goes through these things called birthing pains, that, the, the, that we, as we get, draw nearer and nearer to the second coming of Christ, it says that it is like going into labor. And uh, I don't know um, how many women in this room experienced uh, something called Braxton Hicks contractions uh, during their labor, but it's like false contractions where, where your body is preparing you for something that's likely going to be unpleasant. It has an amazing ending. You have a, a child in your arms, but in uh, leading up to it, there can be some daunting and challenging times. And I remember uh, when the Braxton Hicks contractions began to start for our two children, I mean, I didn't experience them. I just got to witness the experiencing of them. Um, but they were these, there were these, these times where it was a reminder that something is coming and it's going to happen soon. And, uh, and during them, you're like, is it happening now or is this just a warning? And, uh, and those warnings, I remember our first one um, was scheduled to be born, you know, due date early January. Perfect, we'll get some time off over the, the Christmas holidays and we'll relax at home and we'll drive to the hospital in a leisurely manner. This is our first child, so we have no idea what we're getting into. And, uh, you know, it'll be, you know, we went to uh, pre prenatal uh, counts, whatever that, prenatal course, I forget what it's called. But basically, while there, they're like, this is how you help your wife remember how to breathe, and this is how you rub her back so she feels all good. And I'm like, this is going to be easy. Giving birth is, is so simple. And uh, the Braxton Hicks contractions came, and you're like, oh, right, it's going to happen soon. And, and we looked around the house, and we're like, are we ready for this? And these, these contractions began to happen. And what they caused us to do was to, was to look around and go, are we actually ready for a little human being to be in our lives? Because soon that's going to be the case. And uh, whether we're ready or not, it's going to happen. But these contractions came as a, as a slight precursor warning for us that, oh, right, we have some more work to do before, before this baby comes. And uh, it was during some of those decisions, those times of Braxton Hicks contractions, where instead of being in Castigar and doing our leisurely 45-minute drive out to Nelson to get to the hospital on time for the eventual birth of our child, we decided to uh, go to my in-law's house for two weeks because we're like, they're 10 minutes from the hospital, and this is terrifying and scary, and we just need to be closer and ready for this when it comes. And, uh, and that was pretty cool. And... Um, and as I'm considering kind of the way that the, the Bible talks about the end of the world and, or the, the, the coming of Christ and likens it to labor pains that, uh, that a woman feels during birth, um, the Braxton Hicks, Hicks contractions to me kind of jumped out as this very interesting warning, this shaking that exists where, you're, where you recognize like, oh man, something's happening. Am I ready for it? And, uh, and over the last uh, couple of weeks, I've been thinking quite a bit about the shakings, the, the, er the early 
birthing pains, signs that we will, that we have been seeing, that we continue to see, and we will, uh, and we will continue to experience. And, and it has caused me to consider what happens when the whole earth shakes in our lives. What happens in those moments where shakings and trials and tribulations or persecutions or challenges or, um, or disbelief arises, and how do we handle that as believers in Jesus Christ? Because in Hebrews chapter 12, um, it says, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. This is speaking of God speaking to us. For if they did not escape when they refused him who was warned on earth, and this is talking, um, and this is the author of Hebrews writing, and he says, but, it, but we, can't, we can't escape and reject him who warns us from heaven above. And at that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, listen to this promise from God, yet once again, once, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And so God says in his word, he says that he will shake the earths and the heavens. And so it's not a figment of imagination that there's challenges and struggles and shakings that, that exist and come, but it's actually a promise from God that there is this time coming of the shaking of the earth. Yet once more, uh, it continues in 27, verse 27, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So says the word of God. I am convinced that as believers in Jesus, we will experience an increasingly number of tough situations that feel like shakings and tribulations or uh, persecutions in our daily lives. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to stand here and say that, you know, in the next four days this is going to happen because I'm not coming at this with a prophetic um, notion that I that I want to that I want to come forth like a prophet. I want to come forth with a warning. I want to come forth with with a encouragement for you and I today. That as we look back in history, we see these risings and these fallings, these cycles of persecution, of acceptance, of trials and of tribulations for those who hold to the Christian faith, for Christian morals, for Christian values. Um, and that these, throughout time, they've been accepted and challenged in different manners. And guess what? We still exist in time, and as such, we will continue to experience rising and fallings of general acceptances of these things. And God says that, that there is, he will bring a shaking. One thing I want to encourage us off as we go in in this is that throughout the entire word of God, he also says that he safeguards for himself a remnant of people. And so I want to encourage you that as, just as it says here, that we should be thankful and grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And so we're going to look at what happens when shakings exist and how to overcome and walk through these shakings this morning. His word says in Hebrews that he will shake what needs to be shaken. And then the author of Hebrews goes on to say that these shakings are for two reasons. One is to remove that which doesn't need to be there anymore. And the other is to reveal that which is foundational. One shows the things that appear to be but are not. And, uh, and you know, when, uh, when you have something that looks like or appears to be something, but then when it's tested and tried, it proves to be just a, uh, a replica. Like when you buy Oakley sunglasses for $4 off of a panhandler in Europe, and you're like, these look exactly like Oakley sunglasses that I paid $4 for. And you pick up a real pair of Oakleys and a fake pair of Oakleys, and you know instantly that what you bought was not real Oakleys. 
I've never been to Europe, so that's not a personal story. But uh, I've heard stories like this. I've, you know, I've, I've perhaps even purchased some things off of like Instagram or Facebook and gotten them and been like, that's not at all what I expected to get. But there's many things in this life that appear to be something, but when they're tested and tried, they're found out to not be what they are. In fact, there's a ton of things that, there's a huge market, there's a marketing industry totally geared towards knockoff brands. Did you know that Snickers is one of the most um, highly sought after chocolate bars in the United States? And there's a company that makes a Snickers with a different, it's called a Snackers. And it's, it's almost the exact same, almost the exact same, it has the exact same color branding, the same color wording, the same shape lettering, but it says a different word on it, and it's like 40 cents cheaper. And you're like, oh man, I just bought this Snickers and it was so cheap, and then you look at it and you're like, ah, oh, because it's a Snackers. And it's not the same as a Snickers. It's a knockoff brand, and, they, and it's literally designed and built to trick you into purchasing it, um, so that they get your market share and not the actual Snickers that you want. And so there's many things in our lives that appear to be but are not. And, uh, and <laughs> that was a big tangent into things that appear to be but are not, but it was good. And, uh, and so what we see is that, that there, there is a reality to this. But the same exists within our spiritual lives. There are many things that might appear to be uh, spiritual, but when they're put to the test... We run away. We might ap appear to have a sense of godliness about us, but when we're put to the test, when we're put to the fire, when we're questioned in a manner of, of being degraded as to what, do you actually be believe what you say you believe, then there's this, whoa, I don't know if I do. And there's this appearance of things that might be true, but, uh, but when push comes to shove, under trial and fire, we go, maybe, maybe I'm not there. And so a shaking has this ability to reveal that which appears to be but is not. In fact, Jesus talks about this uh, throughout his parables when he talks about the wheat and the tares and how uh, a farmer goes out and sows good seed and it grows wheat, but his neighbor comes in and throws bad uh, seeds all over the ground and all of a sudden the wheats and the tares are growing up together and the, the farm hands go to the farmer and they say, should we pull out the, the tares? And the farmer says, no, leave the tares and the wheats to grow together because if you pull out the tares, you'll inadvertently pull out the wheat because they look almost identical. The difference is, is at harvest time, how they finish their growing cycle is what differentiates between the wheats and the tares. How they finish the race is what separates the wheats and the tares. How we finish this life in faith is what separates those who believe in Jesus and those who say they believe in Jesus. That there's a difference in the actions and the words that people can have. And so uh, we see that uh, Jesus speaks about this concept of things that appear to be but are not. A second thing that happens when shakings exist, when trials or tribulations or persecutions exist, is that they reveal the things that are, that are deep convictions, that are, that are foundational in the way that they are. It leaves us with a foundation that is built upon. Jesus talks about the wise builder in the, in, in the Gospels, and he talks about a, a man who goes out and he builds his house on the sand, and the waves come, and it erodes the foundation because his foundation was built on something that was shakable, something that shifted, and the result was that his house fell down in the waves. But he speaks about a wise builder who goes out and he digs down to the bedrock, he digs all the way down and he, and, he, and he casts a foundation upon this bedrock. And when the wind and the waves came, it beat upon the house, but it could not shake the house because the foundation of that house was on something solid. Church, we are called to place the foundation of our lives on something solid, and that is on the person and the salvation of Jesus Christ. We sang a couple of songs this morning. Bailey and I, we might live together, be married and everything, but we don't always talk. I don't always tell her what I, what I plan on speaking about, and I, I don't 
she doesn't tell me her set list until I see it on my phone after she's created it. And man, this week again and again, every song we sang, I was like, this just lines up with my sermon. We're talking about things that are shaken. We're talking about building our lives on the firm foundation of Jesus. And I was like, thank you, God, for all these confirmations as we continue to th through this. And so I'm excited. I'm excited that... Uh, that although shakings might come, that there is, there is a way that we can overcome these shakings. There is a corporate sense to shakings, um, as I've kind of mentioned, where there might be a, 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 an amount of persecution or trials, and it would cause, within a, a corporate grouping of people, people to go, hey, um, there's a separation in this space. But there's also a a personal aspects to shaking. It's like a house cleaning. Last Monday, put my kid down for a three and a half hour nap. <clears throat> Best Monday gift ever my kid could have given me. And I went outside and I had this back shed in my house. And it's the shed that all summer long, things just get put in, in no orderly manner, none whatsoever. It's like, hey, look at this into the shed it goes. There's no door in the shed. I don't even need to open a door. I can just throw things in this shed. It's in the back of the house. No one ever goes back there. We keep all of the party supplies, the pool, you know, the, the picnic table, um, the chickens. Everything else is at the front of the house to entertain our guests there. Don't go to my shed. It's a disaster. Okay, that's my summer shed. But every winter, I need to, I need to get ready for winter. And so I need to empty out all of my summer ridiculousness, and I need to organize it and put it back in to my shed. And, uh, and this is a daunting task. It takes really a week. And, uh, and it takes, my, my yard is just, there's stuff strewn all over it. There's like miter saws and table saws and other words that end in saw. And, uh, and there's boxes and totes and all this stuff. And, um, and the house cleaning, this, this aspect of cleaning that I have to go through for my shed is an important thing because at the end of it, what I'm left with is a product, is, is a shed that is actually organized and can contain more stuff than it ever did and is clean. And if I know what I want, I know where it is because I just put it away and I can go and I can grab, um, you know, the ratchet straps or whatever it is that I need for that day. Or when my, when my kids are like, hey, can we get our, our winter boots? I'm like, I, I at least now know where they are because I just found them. And so there's this, there's this importance to cleaning out our sheds. There's this importance that I have in preparing for winter. Now I can reorganize the other outbuildings at the property to store all the firewood so my family's going to be warm. And so there's this progression to it of reorganizing, of cleaning. I'm sure if I was to, uh, you know, personify the, the items in my shed, they would see it as a time of shaking. Here they are being you know, rattled and removed from their home that they've had for the last five months, and they're being deposited into the vast plain of my yard, and they don't know what's going to happen next. As a father, I just see little googly eyes on all the little totes, and they have, like, little funny mouths, and they say stories. But there's this shaking that exists as I remove the items from my shed, and I go through what they are. Why do I have this? Does this now need to come into my house? Because it's winter clothes and it's almost winter season. Does this now need to go to the dump because I was just way too lazy and it was way too hot for me to drive to the dump during the summer, but now in the cooler weather, I can get there. Is this something that needs to just be put back into the shed? Does this need to be organized in a different manner? And there's this sense of this personal aspect uh, to being shaken. And I want to look into Hebrews chapter 3 uh, with you today. And it says in verse 5 and 6, so this is talking about how Jesus is greater than that of Moses. The author is writing how, um, as in high honor, the, the Jewish people hold Moses so much so higher should the name of Jesus be held. And he says in verse 5, he says, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were being spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And catch this, church. And we are his house. 
if indeed we hold fast to our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And just as I clean my, my shed every year, I think it's important that we allow God to shake and clean us every year. His house, as declared in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. And, and again, we, we read that, don't you know that you are, your body is God's temple? How important is it to allow that, that temple, that house to be clean, to be shooken, so that the things that don't need to be there, so the things that appear but are not actually important, can be removed? And there can be an organization, there can be, there can be a, 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 um, an order to it. When we read the scriptures, when we read in, in, the, in Genesis 1, God talks about how we go from disorder to order. He is a God that creates order out of the chaos. And let me tell you, my shed this year was chaotic. An order was created. And similarly, in my life, the chaotic things that I find in there are put in order when I allow God to organize it. As we talk about shakings, has anyone ever been in an earthquake in their house? Like they've experienced like an earthquake. And, and I know we've gotten some here in Nelson where, you know, some dishes rattle. Um, but like when you're, when you're part of an, when you're in an earthquake where it's more than just like, did someone just jump on the floor in the other room and it shook the house a little bit? Like when, you, when you're part of a sh earth shaking, house shaking earthquake, it causes a bit of a panic in your mind and you think about those things that you need to grab out of your house immediately like these are the things that are actually important to me these are the things that i actually need and if everything else fell during this earthquake it'd be okay as long as i had these things with me and uh, and sometimes i think that the shakings the trials the challenges um, that we experience are to help us understand that which is most important and foundational in our lives that when when challenge and persecution comes just like peter is able to say throughout the book of acts thank god we were worthy to experience this persecution because it's reminded me of how important my faith in jesus christ is We've perhaps stored up unnecessary things in our lives and uh, tried to build them as foundational pieces of our lives when, in fact, Christ is the only foundation worthy to build our house on. And the things that need to be removed from our house, how much better to remove them now <laughs> than, in the, than in the moment, the heat, the, 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 the panic of... Uh, of the earthquake. I'll tell you something, it is much, I am a much better person when my shed gets cleared, when it's like 20 degrees out, the grass is green and I can be in my bare feet, than if it's minus 20 and there's three feet of snow and I'm trying to get to the back of my shed. And so, church, I want to encourage you today that we should be open before our God. We should come before him and we should just God, here and now, today, are there things in my life that need to be shaken away? Are there things in my life that need to be removed? And there, are there places in my life where I need to rebuild my foundation, my house upon your foundation? Things that need to be taken away. There's some ways in which we can do this. Building consistent habits in our lives is a very important thing. Habits that draw us closer to Jesus. Habits like prayer, private, corporate, communal. Times of reading the word privately, corporately, in your small group starting next Monday. These are great places where we can build habits, where as, as we go, you know, we have those constant reminders, hey, Matt, it's the end of August. Have you cleaned out your shed yet? Accountability. Hey, Matt, now it's the end of September. Have you done it yet? Ah, uh, no, not yet. Hey, Matt, now it's the middle of October. The snow's coming next week. What are you going to do? I don't know. 
We need, we need to have these, these habits, this time of accountability. Interestingly enough, uh, today is a festival that is found in the Word of God. Today is the Day of Atonement, the day of repentance before God, where we come before Him and we, uh, we confess, it says in, in, uh, in, in the uh, Old Testament, that we confess not only the sins we know, but also the sins unknown to us that we've committed. And so it's days like this, habits like this, where we, get in, where we can get into this thing where we go, God, would you forgive me and reveal to me the areas, the, the spaces of my life that need to be shaken and cleaned out and organized for your word? The areas and spaces of my life where I need to come back in repentance before you and then be thankful and celebratory of the fact that Jesus is able to remove those sins from our lives. As we develop these habits of, of the reading, the prayer, the times of repentance and forgiveness, the, the, the understanding and the digesting of his word, it leads us to have deep convictions. And these deep convictions actually are an incredible way to withstand the shakings that exist in life. Because when you're not convicted, when your roots are shallow and someone, and someone pushes against you, like if you have a tree that has very shallow roots and you pushed against it, even a weak man can push over a tree with no roots. But if that tree has deep, solid, strong roots, a windstorm is unable to move it. When we allow God to bring deep convictions into our lives, what it does is it causes us to, in those times of shaking, just as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, that that which is meant to be shaken is shaken, and that which is not won't be. Not meant to be shaken. Not meant to be a weed blown in the wind by every, every thought. Allowing the conviction of God's word to find its place in our heart. Memorizing his word so that we can recognize his voice in the chaos that we find. The other thing we can do, friends, is to recall both these verses that we shared today from Hebrews 3. talks about boasting in our hope and the confidence we have in Jesus. And again, in Hebrews 12, it says that in the hope that we have, in the worship that we bring towards God, our Father, who is a consuming fire. And so having this hope and this certainty in Jesus Christ in times of shaking is so important. When someone is, when there feels like there's an attack against us, or when a lie is being spoken to us, if we are firm and hopeful and certain of the foundation we have in Jesus, then it causes that lie, that, that attack, to be a lot less intense. Because I'm convinced and I'm assured. In the assurance of our faith. Faith is hope. Is hope, faith is hope, placing our hope in something unseen. And, you know, I get that often. Oh, how do you know God exists? Have you ever seen him? Well, it's a rather lofty thing. I've <laughs> but uh, I've certainly seen him at work. And I have faith in the hope and the expectation that what he's done in the past, what he's doing in the present, he'll continue to do in the future. And I can place my hope in this assurance that he calls, that just as he was resurrected from the dead, so might I be resurrected with him. It's this hope and this certainty that even when the habits that we have cause us to stumble, even when the convictions we have might not be deep enough, we can hold on to this, this hope and we go, Jesus, just as you were resurrected from the dead, so will I. I will place my hope in you. Philippians 4.13 is one of the most uh, memorized verses of the Bible. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Have you ever done that while bench pressing? I have. Instantly felt like I needed to repent afterwards. Like put on too much weight on the bar. It's like I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Duh! Funnily, I don't think Paul was weightlifting when he wrote that verse. In fact, if we read just the couple verses before, he says, when I have all that I need or am in all sorts of want, when I'm well-fed or I'm 
really hungry, when I'm starving, when I'm free and, and prancing around and explaining the word of God, or I'm in chains and in jail for proclaiming the word of God. When I'm surrounded by friends or I'm surrounded by enemies, he says, I have learned to be content in each of those situations. Why? Because I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This is the context that Paul speaks this verse in, that it is in the joys and the sorrows, in the simplicity and in the challenge, in the persecution and the acceptance. I can do all these things that Jesus has called me to do because he has strengthened me to do them. It's not on my own strength. When those persecutions come, when Paul was thrown into prison, he relied on the strength of Jesus not on his own strength. And church, I want to encourage you as we close today that no matter the persecutions and the trials, no matter the shakings and the reorganizations and the joys and the, and the simplicities that we experience, when you learn to be content to place your hope in Jesus, we become unshakable in the foundation, as it says in Hebrews 12. He is building the house, and you are the house Will you allow the builder to build? Or will you, the house, try to dictate how the builder builds? This is the question I want to leave you with today, church, is how will you allow God, the builder of your house, to build? Will you let him do it? Because when the whole earth shakes, and it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, it's a promise that we find in scriptures. Do we want to be on a firm foundation? Or do we want to be building our house on the sand? Better to answer and ask these questions now than when the waves start to crash. Should I have dug down deeper and built a better foundation? Too late now. <laughs> Thankfully, we can always cry out to God and his, and his mercy and his grace is so good. It's so good. His salvation is so good. Friends, I want to encourage you today um, to spend some time today seeking God, praying, confessing those sins, and asking for forgiveness. His arms are open wide. His foundation is sufficient, and he is looking to build his, your, his house in your life. Let me bless you this morning, church. Father, I want to bless those who are listening here today, that, Lord, that in their lives this week, God, that your word would become real, that aspects of your word that have for so long been dormant and misunderstood or not comprehended, God, that you would bring revelation to people this week. Lord, I pray a blessing over the individuals who are here, who are listening to this today, God, that their ears would be open to the speaking of your word, that their eyes would see the things that you are doing in their lives, and that their mouths would speak the things that you are placing upon their hearts. Father, I, I want to bless those who are listening to this today, that in confidence and in hope, that they would continue to set the foundation of their lives on you. That just as we sang this morning, I will build my life upon your firm foundation and I will not be shaken. Father, I thank you that you are the firm foundation that causes us to not be shaken. Would you continue to reveal that by your Holy Spirit to us? Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, church, for gathering here this morning, for being here today. Uh, let us just, we'll close in a word of prayer. We'll also pray over this morning's offering, and, uh, and we'll be released to go. So thank you, Father, that we could gather here today, that we could uh, declare who you are, holy, righteous, and true, and as your word says, a consuming fire. Lord, let us come before you with worship and wonder and awe of who you are in certainty and hope of what you've proclaimed and what you've accomplished. Lord, as we go from this place, Father, would you grant us divine appointments where we can better understand who you are, but Lord, that we could also um, speak life into other people's lives. 
that, Lord, that we would have opportunities to see your spirit move, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of our community and, and our neighbors. And, Father, we also lift up this morning's offering to you, and we thank you that you are a God of provision, and you provide for us in so many uh, manners, so many ways, so many things that we don't even know we need, Lord, you provide. And, Lord, as we return a portion of our financial provision back to you this morning, Lord God, would be uh, multiplied for the furtherance of your kingdom. And, Lord, would you, would you br bless both the gift and the giver as, uh, as we return this portion back to you, Lord God. We thank you for this. In the name of Jesus. Amen.